If you do this, I will show you, I will speak to you, I will tell you, and I will manifest to you. Not just I will tell you, but the Hebrew lecha, I will manifest to you. God wants to speak to you this year, speak to us in a way that is more than before. A word to encourage his servant. God is the God of all encouragement. And it begins, call to me. God wants Jeremiah to call to him. God is calling to Jeremiah and telling him, call to me. Why? God wants him to seek. God wants us to seek him. There's something about seeking him that is so important that God says it here because if you stop seeking him, you don't get what the promise is. There's a promise here based on seeking him. Amen. The word in Hebrew is kara. Try it. Kara not only means call to me, it means cry out like, like from your gut. Cry out. Be it to be, mean it from your, all your heart. Seek me. Call to me. You got to mean it. When you seek God, seek from all your heart. But it also means, it also means invite God. Invoke, invite God. God is telling Jeremiah and you, he wants you to invite him. He will come, but you have to invite him. Thinking about, think about this. Messiah said he's going to come again only when he's invited. I will only come again. You will not see me again until my own people, Jerusalem, you say, blessed is he. That's the greeting. That's what you greet in Hebrew when someone comes. Or you're coming, say, come on in. He will only come when he's invited. So there's some, think about what happened in your life when you invited him into your life invite but you have to not stop inviting him it's easy to stop inviting him you're not supposed to be inviting him you're supposed to be inviting his to stop invite his spirit he honors that something about it he, lord come into the situation come into the places you haven't been in he's telling jeremiah he's telling us invite me and i will come this year 2020 invite me the hebrew for this word has roots in the meaning accosting, like you accost somebody. That means to boldly encounter someone. Like they're there and I'm going to come right in there. God wants you to accost him, boldly encounter him. You need to be encountering him this year. And I will answer you. God wants not you just to pray to him. He wants you to encounter him boldly, boldly come into his presence. What does it say in Hebrews? Now we may think this is a specific meaning, I will answer you. It says, then I, it says, I will answer you. Now I might think, okay, then if I do this, I ask, and he answers it, what I ask for. Well, there are promises about him answering, meaning that if you ask according to his will, he will answer, he will, he will do that. But that's not quite what it's saying here. The Hebrew word has much more than I will answer the prayer. Uh, the Hebrew word ana, which can mean answer, also means I will respond to you. That's a little different. I will respond. Call to me with all your heart and I'm going to respond to you like a parent responds to a child to give you whatever you need. You might not even be asking for it. And to give you what God wills and desires for you this year that may be above what you ask and do for you His will. So it's not just saying ask what you want and he'll do it. There's a place for that when it has to do with his will, if it's in his will. But call to him anyway. Not just asking, yes, you ask, bring it all to him, but call to him anyway. Invite him, encounter him anyway, and he will respond to you in a way that's even better than anything you would ask. It also means I will answer you. I'm not, I, will, I will look upon you. I'm going to put my eye on you. I'm going to respond. It's not limited to anything you ask. I have something better and greater which is going to go to where this is going. God wants to respond to you, us, this year in a way that is bigger and better than anything we've asked. And I will answer you and I will show you. The word is Nagad. Try it. Nagad. On Passover, the Jewish people read a book called the Haggadah. You know, that, that, that thing tells the story of the Exodus. Well, that comes from this word, Nagad, which means to show. It means to speak, to tell, to manifest. God's saying, if you do this, I will show you. I will speak to you. I will tell you and I will manifest to you. Not just I will tell you, but the Hebrew lecha. I will manifest to you. God wants to speak to you this year, speak to us in a way that is more than before. God, the Hebrew reads, 
lecha. I will show to you, I will manifest to you. The word now is gadol. Try it. Now you might, some of you might know it. Gadol means great. Great. God wants to show you great things. Gadol also means more. In other words, more than you knew before. God wants to show you more this year than you knew before. More than you've seen, more than you've known. It also means exceeding. In other words, God wants to show you that which exceeds what you have known before. Gadol also means high. God wants to take you higher, show you higher things than you knew before. And Gadol means abundant, which means He wants more abundantly to show you this year. And in the Hebrew, in the text here, in the actual passage, it takes the form of gedolot, which is gedolot, which means, which is actually great plural. So it's not just great, a great thing. I want to show you, I want to show you the great things. I want to show you the many great things. I want to, I want to show you many things that exceed what you had before. I want to, I want to manifest many exceeding things, the great things, the, the exceeding things, the high things this year. The great things, gedolot, gedolot in Hebrew, the great. But then it says, I want to show you something else too. Not only what is greater, but something else. In the Hebrew, uv tsurot, which most translations render as mighty things. And it does mean that, but the word is more interesting than that. It literally means fenced off things, fortified things, inaccessible things, things which are too high to attain, I will, and that's why it's taken as mighty, like a mighty fort. That's really what's behind what you've always heard your whole life. I will show you mighty things, but also means I will show you that which is, has been inaccessible to you before, I will show it to you now. I will manifest it now. It also means that which is so high that you can never get there like, look, I want to walk where I can, I can really overcome that sin and I can overcome that problem and I can be on that level. God is saying, that's where I want to take you this year. That's where I want to take you. I will manifest that which is so high you couldn't get there, you couldn't attain it, but now I want to manifest it to you. That which is fortified maybe by the enemy. Maybe the Lord, the enemy's had a stronghold. God's saying, I want to give that to you now. I want you to break through that stronghold now and give it to you. The word literally means, and again, you wouldn't see this in English, but it literally means cut off or withheld. That which has been withheld from your life, maybe something you've been praying about, it's God's will, but you've been praying, you haven't seen it, which has been withheld, cut off, I will give it to you. I will reveal it to you. God wants to manifest that which has been too high, inaccessible. He wants you to attain it. Which goes on into the last words of the promise. Lo yadatam, from the root word yada, try it. And together it means, yada means no, and together it means that you know not of. It can mean that you know not of. The Hebrew can mean that you don't yet understand or you don't comprehend. I will manifest to you that which has been above what you've understood or what you have known at all. I will show you, and that goes with everything before. When it says God will answer you, it's not talking about necessarily what you asked and what you knew to ask. It's saying I have something greater than what you asked or know. And your asking is to be greater than just asking, but Lord, inviting, Lord, I just want what you have, and I don't want it to be limited by what I'm asking. I want something greater. What is your will? What is greater? Seek what is greater than what I know. God has done great and mighty things in our midst that, we, that I knew not of, that we knew not of, beyond anything we could imagine. But now we know them. So God wants to do something that we don't know, greater things. But the condition, is, there is a condition. It doesn't just say God will do it. It says you have to do something too. If you're not, first of all, you know, when he's talking to Jeremiah, maybe on behalf of the, the righteous of God, but he's talking to Jeremiah who is in God's will. You need to be in God's will. He's in prison, but he's in God's will. First, you've got to be in God's will. All the promises of God are conditioned upon that. If you're not in God's will, don't expect God's blessing. 
Now I'm saying, well, I'm not perfect. No, you're not perfect. But if you're seeking God and as much as you can, more and more, you're going to see more of the will of God, which is the blessing of God. You can't get the blessing of God without the will of God. Some people preach, you just name and claim. That has nothing to do with the Bible. Yes, there are times to name and claim, but according to His will, and you need to be in His will. You won't be perfect, but, be, but seek more to be in His will. Get your life into His will, you, according to the promise here. Of the great and mighty things He's promising here, but there's a condition. Call to Him. Really seek Him this year, more than you have. Invite Him, Lord, come. With all my heart, you must do that. We have to do that more than ever before. Not just seek them, but the words are, Lo yodotam, yodotam, that you know not. The key here is to seek also what you know not. You see, the problem with many believers and many leaders and many ministers and many people in the Lord for a long time is that we think we know. And when you think you know, you stop knowing. You know, you know, you know, you know that's the whole point. And that's the death. That's death. When you think I know. I mean, I know something, but I don't know the half of God. And that keeps us humble. I just mentioned that I saw Steve came up and he just pray, asked for prayer. That's, there are leaders who will never do that. Because they're too much, hey, I'm together. I'm not the one who does it. I don't have to. I don't. Well, when you stop seeking what you know not, you stop knowing that you know not, then you start growing closed off to God. And there's so many ministers, ministries, and denominations that have been dead because of that. Because they stopped. They thought they knew. And when you think you know, you stop knowing. When you know that you don't know, you can start knowing. And it's not that we know God. Yes, but the point is, Lord, there is so much more to you. This is what God's saying. I will show you great and mighty things that you know not of. It's above you. But you'll never get the greatest blessing until you have that attitude. Think about it. You know, I told you I met the pastor. This is 40 years ago. But you know, when Paul spoke about coming to the Lord, it was almost as if it was just yesterday. Because he never lost that attitude. Think about all the great things that God did in your life when you first came to the Lord. Th probably so many of the changes and so many of the blessings happened when you first came to the Lord. Why? Because when you first came to the Lord, you knew you didn't know. And you said, Lord, I want to know. Lord, I, I'm just open. I, I, whatever it is, you show me. I want more of you. I want more. Well, we can lose that. But the thing God is saying, regain that. Come back to that. Seek. Open your mind. If Paul the apostle who wrote most of the books of the New Testament could say it near the end of his life, that I might know him. Don't you say, I got it more than Paul. I know him more. We don't know the third of him. The, we don't know the, the hundredth of him. And so God wants to do something greater than what you're thinking. So we've got to open our minds, open our hearts, and open our lives to seek him. And that means with our life, it means open to change. Lord, I want to go to the level. I'm going to start doing things this year that I haven't done before in you. I'm going to start stepping out as I haven't before. I'm going to start seeking you. I'm going to start praying more than I have before. I'm going to start being in your word and being in your presence more than I have before. I'm going to start repenting more than I have before. Doing changing changes. I know I haven't shared the word of God. I'm going to start doing that. Open your mind and your heart and your life to change and God will, they will open it to the great and mighty things God has. Rabbi Jonathan mentioned the mystery of days and how all of the recent shakings in America we're tied to God's ancient calendar. Explain this. To yeah, <laughs> it's amazing when, when, I, when I first saw this, you know, manifesting. And that is, think of the year of shakings, 2020. Okay, what's the first, what's the first holy appointed day of God in his ancient calendar? It's Passover. Passover is the only feast that has to do with a plague. Think about it. The right. plague. And so when, so the thing but, is. But for those that don't know, yeah. it, it was, uh, if you don't let the Jewish people go, which was a biblical mandate that the Jewish people are entitled to the physical land of Israel forever, a plague will come on you, Egyptians. There's the plague. And it comes on Passover night. And so, and so the people, so, so when does Passover come? In the spring. Okay, so now Jewish people are all celebrating Passover in their houses, talking about the plague passing through the land, and there's a plague passing through the land. And here's Sid, think about this. Passover is the first time in the, in the history of the world that there was a national lockdown. 
<laughs> Think about that. You're they got, right. They were commanded. I, my, my family and friends in Israel were yeah. upset. We are all, we are all, we're told, go into your houses because a plague is passing through your land. So they did. So all the Jewish people are, are, are actually reading the story of the plague and the lockdown while there's a lockdown and a plague and they're in their houses. In Israel, they're actually told on that day, you have to stay in your house until, until the morning, first time in 3,000 years. So that's that. Now, Passover. Okay. There's so much more in the book, but let me go. Now, what's the next? The next major feast is called Shavuot or Pentecost. What is Pentecost? Well, Pentecost is when, when the Holy Spirit comes and the Spirit of God is the breath of God. Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. In, in Hebrew, the word for spirit, ruach, is breath, the breath of God. So we got breath and it's also the time when the fire of God came down, the fire, the tongues of fire, the fire, the baptism of the fire. It's breath and fire. What's the, all these things now become judgment. What's the next shaking of America? It begins with breath. A man, a man says, I can't breathe. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, shaking all over America, the riots of, of the, and, and they're all they're chanting, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Fire. What happens across America? Fires. All the, city, the cities go on fire. Remember all the shaking. Okay, when did it start? It started the Jewish people on Shavuot, Pentecost, of the night of May 28th. They're, they're lighting the candles, saying the blessing of the fire. That is the night it all exploded across the country on the very time. And it led right into Pentecost Sunday. We're talking about the fire of God. That's for us, but there's a fire of judgment as well. So that's that. Now, what's the next one? The next one I just alluded to before, but I'm going to get the next one. We said Feast of Trumpets. OK, the trumpets are blown. But what is it? And you know this, Sid, from your childhood, from my childhood. It's all about the judgment of God. And it says that he's going to in his heavenly court, he decides he makes the decree. So the eyes are to turn to the most high court and the judge and the judgment. And what happens on the Feast of Trumpets? All the eyes of America turn to its highest court, the Supreme Court, when the judge when a judge is taken away, it says that God decides on that day who passes from the earth. So the judge is taken away, Judge Ginsburg, and, and it's really God is the judge. And the thing is that that is the very act, as we alluded to, opens the door. Feast of Trumpets is about turning back, turning away from your evil. Because the replacement voted the, the right way. That's what it's going to lead to. And actually, the next holy day was actually Shabbat Shuvah, the day of the turning when the replacement comes. So it's all and and see it. And, and during the during the Feast of Trumpets, one of the prayers that everybody's praying there, the Jewish people are praying. The prayer says, remove the evil decree, remove the evil of the decree. Now think of Roe versus Wade, 60 million children. It was the Feast of Trumpets that God began the removal of the evil decree. Who could do this? It is beyond imagination, this irrefutable evidence put before you that the Bible is from God. How are these mysteries tied to something like January 6th and the events that took place on Capitol Hill, Rabbi? Well, this is one, Sid, where one of the books I, 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 review, I spoke of here called The Paradigm speaks of the leaders of America and how they, they parallel these ancient leaders. One of them was Trump. Now, this is one example of something that we spoke about four years before it happened, and then it came true. It's in, it's in the book, but I put it in now, the Josiah mystery, the fulfillment. And here's the thing. Jehu, Trump, you want to understand Trump, understand Jehu. Trump follows the prototype of Jehu. Can you explain Jehu Je for a second? Jehu is a wild guy. <laughs> He's un predictable. He nobody knows where he, what he's going to do. He doesn't. But he's used of God to to turn back and uh, the fall of a nation and an evil thing. So he comes to power suddenly crazy. It's all crazy. But he actually turns back to a degree. OK, now Trump is father. So much to this. He actually comes head to head against the nation's former first lady. Jehu did. So did Trump. So did Trump. Hold. There's so much, but I won't go into it. But the thing is that so the thing is at one point I never shared this before is that Jehu calls for people to come to the Capitol, a national gathering, and then and this is not about we're not judging it. Well, I'm just telling you this is the template. This is the mystery. And so then he his people are are stationed around a great Capitol building. OK, hmm. and then the people of Jehu 
enter the building and storm the building while there's proceedings going on in the building, okay? And I'm not gonna go into all the stuff except I'll say this, okay? The, at the end of that week of the Capitol Hill riot, so it all happens there, it all happens again, it all replays. At the end of that week, there were, the, the Capitol Police announced how many people they arrested who stormed the building, okay, or part of this. And they said 80 people, they arrested 80, right. 80, 80. Go to the Bible, you'll see the word about Jehu, you'll see Shmonim Ish. It says the number of people that went into the building were 80 men. I, and th now the thing is, now I wanna, I wanna throw in more, okay, just the time we have. That is that, at this, it's this war between Jehu and the Temple of Baal. Remember, Jehu was against Baal. Baal was about child sacrifice, so Donald Trump, whatever you think of him, became the president more than any other who set in motion the ending of Roe versus Wade. I mean, because that, sure. that's all in Jehu. But the thing, another thing, Sid, strange thing, it's like a warfare between Baal and Jehu, that when Trump was rising to the presidency, when he announced his, his presidency, the temple of Baal in the Middle East actually fell to the ground two months later. And then, when he was about to become president, the arch of Baal appears in New York City. I actually, we were actually filmed it. It's actually on the, on the DVD. It's like a film. And then, remember when they had the, remember they had the hearings about Kavanaugh? You know, because it was about abortion. They didn't want it over, that was mm -hmm. part of the overturn. Well, the, as they're having the hearings, now the arch appears in Washington right in front of the Capitol building. This is a war between Bale. Just clarify yeah. about what it's, what, what did it say? It was the Arch of Bale, which is the recreation. What is the Arch of Bale? The Arch of Bale, it was the recreation of the Arch of Bale from the Temple of Bale that was in the Middle East that fell when Trump announced his candidacy. Now they recreated it and it appears in Washington and New York. And the thing is that even after he was out of office, Sid, it's what he did by appointing those three ones, particularly Amy Barrett, the, the one vote, the child of the Nile, we'll, we'll get into, actually pulled down the House of Baal, Roe versus Wade. Could Haman, Mordecai, and Esther actually hold the key to the events that changed America's history? Rabbi Jonathan said, that many of these mysteries are tied to specific events that happen on specific days in the Bible, but they also correspond to the exact days of recent events. What do you mean? In the book of Esther, Haman, the, the evil man that rises, he issues a decree to bring death and destruction to the Jewish people. Okay, now that decree is linked to the month, is, is dated at Adar 13, or the 13th day of the 12th month, okay? Now, this is something I just saw, Sid. The day we spoke about this, this evil decree of abortion, the day that Roe versus Wade was heard between, uh, at the Supreme Court, was December 13th, it was the 13th day of the 12th month, the day of the evil decree. That's mm -hmm. when it came. Now, but in the book of Esther, an answer comes, Mordechai, you know, and as they issue a second decree to nullify the first decree, you know. And so there actually was another case that came up and that actually nullified Roe versus Wade. It was called Dobbs versus Jackson. And that's what overturned abortion. So, so you got the evil decree, then you have this. Well, the day that, the, that Mordechai issued the good decree that nullified the evil decree was the day called Sivan 23. In the Hebrew, the 23rd day of the month of Sivan. That day became a day in the Jewish world to pray for the undoing, to the reversing of evil decrees. So all around the world, okay. Now, the day that Dobbs versus Jackson was sent to the Supreme Court, it was June 15th, 20, in, in 2020. But on the God's calendar, it was Sivan 23, the day of undoing the evil decree, the day of the second, the second document that that undoes the first document. So while it's going, to, it's going to undo Roe versus Wade on the day of of undoing the evil decree, and the Jewish people are praying, Lord, undo the evil decree. God has it all in His hand. I mean, it's amazing. And I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this in. I didn't plan on this, but but because there's so much. But to say that also that decree, when you look at that that case that undid Roe versus Wade. Everything follows the same mystery of the Jubilee, but redemption. For instance, it, it goes to the court, not just on the day, 50 years to when Roe versus Wade did. It is accepted by the court 50 years from Roe versus Wade to the month. It is, it is, tr it is given a hearing 50 years to, the, to Roe versus Wade to the month. It is actually even leaked. Remember the leak in this? Yes. It was leaked 50 years from when Roe versus Wade was leaked. <laughs> and, and finally, when Roe versus Wade was overturned, it was overturned right in the middle of its jubilee, the year of Jubilee, the year that God 
undoes, reverses, and brings redemption. That, you know, Jonathan, when you see all of these, now, you've just heard a few, but when you see all of these, and you know you haven't even scratched the surface, yeah. how can someone say, I don't believe the Bible is from God? Impossible. Yeah, and, and, you, and you know what? It's, I didn't even say this. You know, you know, there was a day in the Bible another, when, when the, the people in exile came back to Israel, they started rebuilding the temple, but opposition, st they stopped working on God's thing. And, and so Haggai, the prophet, comes to them and says, says, there's a curse on the land because you stopped. It stopped the, well, well they say, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna rebuild it. They rebuild it. The day that they, the curse was broken was the 24th day of the sixth month, okay? 24th day of the sixth month, okay. Roe versus Wade was overturned on the 24th day of the sixth month, the day of breaking the curse. The day, of, who could do that? And, 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 and another thing, Sid, there's something called the child of the Nile, and I'll mention this, and I'll just say the principle quickly, and that is that, you know, Moses was the baby, when they were killing babies, he was the baby who went to the Nile, who could have been killed, he survived, he grows up to undo all those things. You know, he, he's the one who broke the power of Egypt that tried to kill. Well, could there have been a baby born during, the, during that initial uh, slaughter of children that actually grew up to overturn. Well, there was, and her name was Amy Barrett. She was born right in the midst of it. When she was born right in between the hearings of Roe versus Wade in the Supreme Court, she grew up, she be, Trump appointed her on the day of the Trump, at that moment when everything's coming together, remember? On the day of the turning, Shuva, she comes to it. Her first, basically most of her first year in office, it's her Jubilee year. And she votes to overturn Roe versus Wade. She's the casting vote, the one vote on her jubilee. She's 50 years old when it happens. And that, and, and that all converges. We're, we're talking about God is real. <laughs> Irrefutable proof. Now, earlier, Rabbi Jonathan spoke about a supernatural event that he witnessed that changed the history of America. We have that footage. Rabbi, give us a brief yeah. understanding. Yeah, this was the day that, remember we said all the holy days kind of, lead up. well, this is the holy day of Shabbat Shuvah and the year of the plague, the first year, and we had this gathering, God says. The turning, the, turn, the repentance. The return, it says return, return. We had the gathering in the National Mall, return. It turned out to be, it was called, the day turned out to be Shabbat Shuvah, the day of the return or the turning of a nation. God appoints it for the turning of a nation. On that actual day, Trump is at the White House and he is setting in motion the turning back of abortion on the day of the turning. And then we got to the end part and I'm on the mall and I said, now we're going to seal it with God's sign, the trumpet shofars. We had about six men up there. They sound, I said, now we seal it, shout when you hear it, Jericho. And I said, now, now the, the go forth the power of God. And I said, go. And the day, the exact time code was, was five o'clock, four minutes and 33 seconds at the White House. At the same exact moment, Trump opens his mouth and he begins, the overturning of abortion began at 5 p.m., 4 minutes and 33 seconds on the day of turning, at the moment of turning, with the child of the Nile at his side. Jay, who, everything came together at that moment. Irrefutable proof. Let's look at that actual miraculous footage right now. From here, and Lord, we, as we seal the return, and the power of God. Now, Lord, let the sound of your power go forth to the world. And yet, Jesus, Yeshua's name, go. I stand before you today to fulfill one of my highest and most important duties under the United States Constitution, the nomination of a Supreme Court Justice. What can we expect? Expect the same end time glory that was released on the White House, that was released in Cuba right here next. Right back to It's Supernatural. I'm going to tell you about one of the most unique, exclusive, prophetic things that I believe you're not going to want to miss and that you can't get in any store, not on Amazon or anywhere. 
The Josiah Manifesto Uncensored. This is the only source of the uncensored material. With eight one-hour DVDs, I'm gonna be sharing with you the deep revelations of God I can't share elsewhere, and not only the deeper revelations of the mysteries in the book, but I'm gonna open up entirely other mysteries. And you're not only gonna read of the mysteries, you're gonna actually see them unfold before your eyes. You're gonna see prophetic manifestations, even that of an ancient God or spirit on the streets of New York City. You're gonna actually see the event, the prophetic moment that altered the course of history of America and much, much more. And I'm gonna be sharing what you need to know to be prepared, to stand, to survive, to prevail in the days ahead, in the last days, and in all that is yet to come. We now return, now return to It's Supernatural. Jonathan, what are the prophetic ramifications of the Josiah moment? Yeah, this is, this is where it all comes. And, and the book is revealing where we are and what's ahead of us. What, it, what we are in is this Josiah moment, which is a, a crucial moment, really the most critical moment, because Josiah, not only he lived at the end of the kingdom. So it was a kingdom that had fallen from God in apostasy, actually dealt with gender and dealt with, all, with offering huh. children. And it was, it was heading to judgment. And so on one hand, the, the sign of the broken altar is linked to judgment, but it's also linked to revival. One person here. So the thing is that it, the whole nation was hanging in the balance. And I believe right now America and also others are hanging in the balance and God's people are critical. And the thing is that, and even we are even seeing God's people who are kind of being swept away by the darkness while others are standing stronger. So this is gonna separate, the grays are disappearing. And, and the dark is gonna get darker, the light is gonna get lighter. And that is why, that is why all, we're talking about all these mysteries today, all these things are leading to a, really a message from God. And that's why much of the last part of the book, which is the last third, is all about the manual for God's Josiahs right now. Whoever you are, God has a plan, and, there's, and we have to pray for this nation because that's where we are. But what do we do? And can we actually change history? That's what the manifesto, that's what it's all about. Well, I believe that we're about to see history changed. What are some of the revelations revealed in the manifesto? Well, it's gonna, it's number one, it's gonna tell us how to live as you know, it's a mystery to the book of Acts, because we have to live that way now, you know, and there has to be, and we have to know, we have to take a stand and we have to get, become radical, revolutionary. This faith has to return to where it was at the beginning, which is the book of Acts. That's where the power and that's where the spirit is. And so there is, so Josiah was revolutionary. And I wanna, I wanna, there's so many things in the manifesto that I want people to, to have, but what I wanna say is one part. At the near, in his, the midst of his life, he was led to go to Bethel. There was an altar there. He, he struck down the altars. And at that point, a man t turns to him and says, he says, um, this is the place where the man prophesied you would come there, the, a man named Josiah would come and do what you did. In other words, centuries before Josiah did that, it was prophesied. Mm -hmm. He was a person of destiny, okay? And one of the things about with the manifesto is for, how do you find your destiny in a time in, in such, such as this? You know, these are evil times, but it didn't stop the light of God. It didn't stop Josiah fulfilling his calling. Nothing can stop you fulfilling your calling in God. Nothing can stop the purposes of God either. And there's a way to do that. There's a way to do it. One of the things it says in the manifesto is that Josiah was born for his age. He was appointed. He didn't just, he didn't just live. He was, we are appointed for this age. Everyone watching, you were appointed to live for this age, and you have a job to do. We have a job to do in this earth. And the thing is that, and there is a destiny as well. And the question is, you know, can one person actually change history? The answer is yes. Josiah was one person, and he changed the history of his nation. You are, whoever's watching, you are one person. And we are together, we are powerful. One person can change the world. You know, 12 people can change the world, 12 disciples can change the world, and this generation. So each of us, we were appointed. So don't fear the end times, and don't say, you know, oh, I, I wish I was living in some other time. God chose you to be living in this day and age. So the, this is just a, a small taste of the manifesto, but what do we need? There are specific things we need to do, but but God has a plan, God knows the plan, God has the way, and that's, what, that's what's gonna be revealed at the end of the Josiah Manifesto. And I have a word for you. God has not given up on you. No matter how far away you are from God, his heart is still reaching out. No matter what you've done, 
His heart is still reaching out to you and wants to embrace you with a love that you've never experienced before. Something happened in Cuba that is a foretaste of hope for the world in the midst of such darkness. We began, Sid, in Cuba. When you asked me, you handed something to Fidel Castro that was actually a sign yes. of how much time he would have. Well, at the very beginning, when they, I was asked to come and open up this, this month of celebration in Cuba of the gospel, for freedom for the first time for one month. And it was the, the theme was Jubilee, Jubilee, Jubilee. And when I, when I, that night, the first night, I was asked to speak uh, to this night gathering. And that night, God revealed himself in a way I've never seen. And that is that I, I had the message I was going to share, what I was led to share was the message of Joel. If you'll come back to God, if you'll repent for a nation or for a person, God is going to restore the years the locusts have eaten. God's going to break the curse. God's going to open the heavens and he's going to pour out the spirit. So and blessing. So I'm ready to do that, Sid. And I have my I have my talit, I have my shofar, which we have here because we're going to do it. Um, and the thing is that as I'm about to before I could even get to the stage, all of a sudden there's a plague of insects. Now, now Joel, Joel, Joel opens up with a plague of insects. All of a sudden, I'm swarming over everybody. I open up the Bible to Joel, and the insects are landing on the, on the scriptures about the insects. And then, then it says it's a day of darkness, and the next thing that happens, everything goes dark. There's, everybody's in dark, and they're praying, and these are Christians, they're praying and praying. And then I won't even go into, so even more happened with the light, I won't even do that. But I get up on the stage, and now I'm gonna speak about Joel. Now, if I had spoken about tomato farming, they would have repented at that stage. <laughs> but the thing is, I, I'm speaking, and I say, you know, God's going to open the heaven. The next thing in Joel is they're repenting. So, we're, so they're praying repentance. That's the key. Repent and pray for revival. So we are. Then all of a sudden, I say, I'm going to sound the shofar. I, I sound the shofar. I said, let the power of God, like in Washington. I said, and all of a sudden, the heavens open up and rain comes on everyone. The next thing in Joel, it says, I will open the heavens and bring rain. Then, then I said, you know, it just stops then. I said, you know what? God's going to bring revival like that. I leave the stage, and about 20 minutes later, a second, Joel says, a second rain, the latter rain. The second rain comes, the latter rain comes, and now it comes as a little drop, then it comes, then it becomes a, a downpour, then a deluge, and then, and then it explodes into deluge, and the people don't leave because as the rain came down, God says, I will pour out my spirit in all flesh, and all of a sudden, the spirit, the rain is coming, and the spirit's coming, and the people are exploding in worship, the children are worshiping, every, they never left. And this revival broke out in Cuba on the day of Joel. And so God, and God was saying, you know, they, they called it the unforgettable night in Cuba. And the thing is, I said, Lord, what's that about? He said, this is what, this is what's coming. I promised there was one outpouring. In Israel, there's two pourings, the former rains and the latter rains. There was one outpouring. God says, I'm giving another one. So listen, everybody, you know, God has promised that for us. We have to pray for it. We have to be like Joel, but whatever you have to do in your life, get it right. Go full blast for God. Turn to God. God says, I will open the heavens on your life and on the nation and on the world. And I believe that'll happen as Jonathan blows that shofar. This is the shofar. And by the way, what I gave to Fidel Castro was a shofar. <laughs> One of the things I gave. That's my father's talit. You be careful, John. I, I'm going to, that's more pressure. And this is the sign of God's power. And we're going to pray right now for the power of God to come upon the earth of the world, to pray for the end time revival, to pray for revival in America, and to pray for revival in your life and all that you need. Lift up your hands to the Lord, be consecrated to him, and receive as from the Lord the sound. In the name of Yeshua, we declare the power of God and revival, the end time outpouring, Father, and your power for each one right now in the name of Messiah. 